Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nothing really going on in the world of democracy and elections uh, that, that is capturing attention. So, um, no, in, in, in the wake of what happened in, in, in Iowa, um, and uh, which has all kinds of fascinating elements, not just a slow count, um, but um, it is a really good time to think about elections, democracy, and we have put together this forum with the Election Reformers Network uh, that I'm super pleased to uh, have Fairboat be part of. I'm Rob Ritchie, uh, President and CEO of Fairboat, um, and um, I'm going to have uh, Kevin uh, explain why the Election Reformers Network uh, has joined with us in this, and uh, they are a terrific new player in the election reform world, um, and Kevin has a really fascinating personal history and a great group for you all to learn more about. Kevin. Rob, for that introduction. Hi, everyone. Thank you for giving us some of your time this afternoon. It's going to be interesting to hear um, what you all think, what people have to say, share some good ideas. Um, one thing that's been really fun has been getting to know Rob a little bit and, um, and, and the organization that you run so well. Uh, and so it's a, it's really is a, it's a great honor to co-host this, this event with you. Um, we, one of the things that we did, one of the first things that my organization did when we got started was to go to Rob for advice. Uh, and that was, he was nice to say that that was a nice kind of closing of the circle, closing, completing the loop in a way, because when Rob started back in 1992, one of his first conversations with, with, was with Larry Garber, who at the time was the election specialist at National Democratic Institute. He was gonna be here, but maybe he, uh, maybe he's still coming in, but he's on, on my board. Uh, and it's part of our organization. So it was nice to, to close that loop then. Um, and I think we talked with you and Cynthia at that point, if I remember, as we got started. Um, the organization I run, Election Reformers Network, uh, was founded by people like, like Larry, who played key roles in structural changes that ended communist dictatorship in Central and Eastern Europe and ended apartheid in South Africa. We did this work with organizations like the National Democratic Institute, and I was just mentioning, International Republican Institute, International Foundation for Electoral Systems, Carter Center, as we helped lead the U.S. contribution to the greatest expansion of democracy in history. Uh, beginning in 2016, a group of us came together, uh, people acting in their individual capacities, but drawing on that shared background to help advance the changes needed here. Um, the work overseas was never, was never really about replicating American institutions. Uh, there would have been no takers if we had been out promoting a system where the head of state is elected kind of by an electoral college. Um, there would have been no takers if we had been out promoting a system where uh, election administrators are senior members of competing political parties and are sometimes candidates in the elections that they supervise. Um, and there would also have been no takers or very few takers for what brings us here today, which is first past the post in single member districts. Over the 50 years of really enormous expansion of democracy around the globe, scores of countries have had that constitutional moment, the opportunity to uh, move beyond an authoritarian past and the opportunity to create new election systems, new constitutional arrangements. Virtually none has selected the system we use of first past the post in single member districts. These countries all had in common, uh, con th these countries all had in common that they had to design a system that would manage conflict arising from deep divisions in their societies divisions like those between the elites who had benefited from communism and the majority that hadn't, divisions between multiple ethnic groups in post-colonial countries, divisions between the whites who had always ruled South Africa and the blacks who were demanding their turn. Uh, writers of new constitutions and designers of new election systems all realized that first past the post in single member districts is very poorly designed to manage such divisions and such conflicts. And it, indeed, it is very poorly designed to manage our conflicts and our divisions. We owe uh, a lot of gratitude to scholars like Lee Drutman, who have helped us to see that uh, the polarization that we are experiencing now 
is not the result of a change in our technology or a change in our culture. Uh, the doom loop, in a sense, is inherent in the system we use and was only mitigated in prior generations through sort of historical anomalies. Another way of saying the same thing is to point out that our problems have a lot more to do with bad rules than bad guys. One of our challenges as a movement is that it's a lot easier to mobilize people and mobilize money with, by talking about bad guys. But it's very difficult for a bad guy oriented movement to forge the consensus that we need to fix bad rules. We're here to talk about the most important fix to our bad rules that has yet been introduced, the Fair Representation Act the one reform to save America, in the words of David Brooks. We have a terrific group of speakers to discuss its many important attributes. I will just make one observation before I hand off the microphone. And that is to say that we have come to define ourselves on the basis of those maps, those maps that have huge splotches of red and blue. Um, the, Fair rep the Fair Representation Act exposes those big blocks of red and blue for what they really are, rounding errors, and enables us to reveal the true, complex, beautiful American patchwork quilt that's always hidden beneath. Thank you. Very nicely said, Kevin. Um, I wanted to say that um, this is not our first forum at NYU DC, and just wanted to thank NYU DC um, uh, and Tom McIntyre, uh, who is the head of the program here, for the opportunity to, to, to be here. We did a series of, of sessions back in 2013, 2014, called Democracy Next, and that was um, a, a way to, to bring together a, a set of ideas that we thought should be on the table um, for thinking about elections and electoral reform. Um, and at the part, part of that was, was the Fair Representation Act uh, changing winner-take-all elections. We also work on ranked choice voting, national popular vote, a right to vote in the Constitution. We've zeroed in particularly on ranked choice voting um, as something that can be won right now. I think what we saw in Iowa is a good example of where that's a really good place to use ranked choice voting, um, and, uh, uh, among others. Uh, the Fair Representation Act, I think, as you'll hear today from a different voices from different perspectives, I think is, is not just a should, it really is an imperative to have this conversation. And I think that's what's changed while I've worked at Fair Vote. We've gone from where this would be great to win, which I've always thought to be true, to something where I think we have to have this conversation. And, and you'll hear different perspectives. One thing that's, I think, important when you think about reform is that there's no single reason for it. There's no single uh, value people bring to it. It's like a coalition that passes things in the legislature or a, a political party has a lot of different perspectives. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll tease some of those out, like Lee Drutman believes we should have a lot of different parties. Maybe me, Neil thinks we should have more independence and, 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 and maybe weaker parties, and, and we might be somewhere in the middle, and there's sort of different perspectives about that. You know, people who focus on women's representation, people of color, uh, polarization. The thing that's true right now is they all come together where they're all true in, 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 in different ways. And of course, they can't be exactly true, but they're part of forging a consensus for change. And we'll hear from a series of speakers, including Don Beyer, who uh, put forward the Fair Representation Act in Congress and starting that conversation in our highest body. Um, so um, as we move forward, I, I think uh, you'll hear a lot of different voices. We're going to have opportunities for you to, to regularly ask questions. Um, and then we'll end with a nice, nice uh, reception at the end. So Pedro Her uh, Hernandez in our Law and Policy Department has done a whole lot to make this possible. Uh, Drew Penrose, who is our head of that department, is with his new baby, um, so he is not here today. Um, but um, uh, Pedro has, has done a lot of work uh, from our California office on this, and he's going to walk us through just what the Fair Representation Act is. So Pedro Hernandez. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my name is Pedro Hernandez. I'm the senior policy coordinator at Fair Vote. Um, I focus on ranked choice voting and voting rights. Um, so we're here today because we know instinctively in our hearts that there is a better way to hold our elections. Um, yeah. <laughs> this looks a little funny, but 
Um, consider our current electoral system. There are 435 representatives that are elected to the House of Representatives. Under this system, an overwhelming majority of voters are, um, live in districts um, locked up for one of the two major parties. Um, where they live seriously affects the kind of representation they get. Um, you have statewide results lean towards one party and you have a majority of congressional seats go to the other party. Um, this is clearly out of step with the wills of the voters. These are because they are winner take all uh, districts. Somehow I can't get this thing to not work right here. All right. So we'll just go off of this. These winner-take-all rules lead to vote splitting in which candidates can and do win with very little support. Um, it leads to strategic voting where voters feel uh, that they need to vote for a lesser of two evils. Um, there's a general lack of competition um, in these safely drawn seats. Uh, incumbents need only to worry about being challenged in their primary. If, elected, if electeds aren't accountable to voters, they're enveloped in a feedback loop that makes them more extreme. Uh, leading to more polarized positions, and this is one of the reasons why gerrymandering is a threat to our democracy. Um, that's right. Yeah. Um, at its heart, the Fair Representation Act is founded on the principle of fair representation, and what do we mean by this? We mean reflective representation. Um, okay. That downloaded funny. Um, I'm just going to go off the Google Slides. Always technology, huh? <laughs> One second. It could be that, yeah, I think so. That looks better. Yeah, that looks right. Uh, this is not a novice concept. Um, in fact, it's what the framers envisioned. Consider the following quote from John Adams. Um, it, should feel, it, sh it should be in miniature an exact portrait of the people at large. It should think, feel, reason, and act like them. Uh, the House of Representatives was founded on this idea, and we know that the voters' will was very important to the framers uh, since it was the only directly elected body at the time that we, had, that we wrote our Constitution. The Fair Representation Act has three elements, multi-member districts, ranked choice voting to make sure that no vote is wasted, um, and independent redistricting commissions that ensure that the lines are drawn fairly. Uh, in this example, Democratic voters who, because of geography, only have one seat in Louisiana, under the FRA, voters could have greater say in who represents them. We can have two, perhaps. We can have libertarians elected from the Bay Area. We could have rural Democrats elected again. With multi-member districts, rather than a single winner who represents an entire district, multiple people represent a portion of the district, and therefore each person only needs a portion of the votes to win. Ranked choice voting, voters get to rank candidates in order of preference if no vote can't if your first choice can't win, your vote can count for a second choice. Um, this way more people are represented. Um, modern experiences with ranked choice voting are encouraging. Uh, in Maine, 47% of voters said RCV was very easy, somewhat easy, and only 10% said it was hard. Maine now uses ranked choice voting for federal elections. 74. Oh. Oh, yeah. Fair vote studies, <laughs> how voters are engaging with their ballots. We look at the way they uh, effectively use their rankings to see whether or not they're engaging with the ranking itself and how they're using it. And what we're seeing are high levels of rankings across jurisdictions that use ranked ballots. Maine uses single 
winner rank choice voting where the amount of votes it takes to win is 50% plus one with um, multi-member districts and multi-seat rank choice voting which is part of the Fair Representation Act um, it raises the question how do we get to this fair representation uh, how do we determine which candidates get elected in these districts under the FRA election thre thresholds are lowered to ensure more voters are represented however high enough that it's mathematically impossible for another candidate to win if you're electing three members of Congress in a multi-member district, the threshold to win is 25% plus one because it's mathematically impossible for a fourth candidate to have that same amount. Thus, the percentage of votes required depends on the number of seats up for election. The more seats you fill, the lower the threshold is to elect. Here's how it works. Voters rank candidates in order of choice <coughs> All first, choice are count, four first choices are counted. If a candidate has enough votes, they win. For example, in a three winner contest, that person will have needs 25% plus one. Um, if a candidate wins with more votes than the election threshold, but not all the seats have been fail, filled, uh, extra votes are proportionally counted towards the voters next choices. Voters shouldn't be punished for supporting popular candidates. 50% of voters should get 50% of representation, right? If my vote is worth a dollar and my favorite candidate only needed 90 cents to get elected, 10 cents can be counted towards my next choice. If no candidate has enough votes to win, the candidate who with the least amount of votes is defeated and votes for that candidate are counted for those voters next choices. This process continues until every seat is filled. So again, the three main elements of the Fair Representation Act are multi-member districts, ranked choice voting, and independent redistricting commissions. What are the benefits? Civil campaigns, ranked choice voting creates more issue focus in civil campaigns. We're seeing, these, we're seeing this live in Bay Area elections. We're seeing this live in Minneapolis. Um, it gives incentives to work together or at least not come after each other too hard. Um, fair representation, um, it evens the playing field. We wanna open up the kind, we wanna open up the field of who, of what kind of candidates uh, we see. And with larger multi-member districts and fair representation, we will see a more diverse reflective electorate. Here's a quote from Don Byer, who, who you will be hearing from later. Um, voters want government that works for them, right? There's a strong feeling from voters on the left and the right that Congress isn't working. Um, the biggest mistake we make is thinking that the way we vote now is the way we have always voted or it's the way that it has to be. There is a better way to do things. Uh, this starts by proposing tried and tested bold solutions uh, the Fair Representation Act contains elements that are found in democracies across the globe. Um, we need bold solutions, right, to give voters a meaningful vote. Um, and thank you for attending today's events. I invite you all to write questions. There will be index cards, um, and we'll be collecting those during each session. Uh, my hope is that we think deeply and wrestle with the question of what it means to be represented. Thank you. So up next is Lee and Sangeeta, but Sangeeta and, and Neil. So do you have a, a slide? And if you're on Twitter and tweeting about this, you can use the hashtag FRA2020. Great. Thank you, Pedro. Um, good afternoon. My name is Sangeeta Sigdial, and I'm Executive Vice President at FairVote. I joined the organization in early 2019, um, right when there was a great level of interest and traction building up in the country for ranked choice voting. 
we are seeing a surge in interest across the country with the latest victory last November in New York City, which triples the number of people using ranked choice voting across the United States. I oversee the organization's strategy, operations, and programs, especially as we enter a period when the opportunity to raise national consciousness for ranked choice voting opens up. I'm thrilled to moderate the upcoming panel with two guests and noted authors, Lee Druckmann and Neil Simon, who are seated right here in front. They bring different and interesting perspectives based on their research and personal experiences within our political system. Lee is a senior fellow in the political reform program at New America Foundation. He's an avid supporter of ranked choice voting and proportional representation. He writes regularly on Vox.com and other political blogs. His latest book is titled Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop that was referred to in the opening comments, The Case for Multi-Party Democracy in America. A praise for the book from the editor of National Affairs reads, Whatever your politics, Lee's profound and important new book will leave you thinking differently about, your polarized, about our polarized moment and the possible paths to recovery. After Lee describes the premise of his book and the historical context for the doom loop that he says we are in, Neil Simon will share his personal journey as a candidate in the current political system. Neil ran as an independent for a US Senate seat in Maryland in 2018 polling as high as 18% in a three-way race. Unaffiliated with any political party, he ran to unite a country and to bring pragmatism back to Washington. Before seeking office, he was CEO of two private companies. He's an active community leader and serves on the board of several nonprofits and political reform groups. His recently released book, Contract to Unite America, 10 Reforms to Re Reclaim Our Republic, outlines what is wrong with our reform, with our, sorry, with our broken political system and how we can fix it together. The book will be on uh, sale upstairs and he may be uh, happy to sign the books. It's uh, on sale upstairs. So without any further ado, let's hear from each of them, followed by a conversation about how we can fix Congress and our political system. Lee, you're next. Well, thank you for that introduction, Sangeeta, and, and it's a real thrill to be part of this. I, I'm a huge supporter of the Fair Representation Act. I think it's the single most important piece of legislation that we could pass to fix our democracy. So I wrote a book uh, that is out. You can order it now wherever you order books from called Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop. Uh, and I, I wrote it because I was really worried about what's going on in our democracy. Anybody else in here worried about? <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of folks are. Now, I mean, a lot of folks woke up to the idea that we might have a problem when they woke up on November 9th, 2016, and Donald Trump had just been elected president. But I think we ought to imagine the counterfactual if Hillary Clinton had won. And think for a moment, where would we be today? Would we be any better off? Would we be in the same hyper-partisan politics? Would Hillary Clinton now be on her third impeachment? Would things be looking even more dire, potentially, ahead of the 2020 election? So the point is that it's not just about which side wins. We're in a moment of intense hyper-partisanship in this country. Uh, and this is not working. Uh, it, it doesn't work with our system of government, which demands broad compromise, and it doesn't work with our brains, it, which are prone very much to us against them thinking, and it's driving us all insane. Now, in the book, I, I describe what I call the doom loop, which is basically a, a feedback loop that is out of control, and we've gotten to this moment of, of hyper-partisanship uh, because we now have two national political parties that are truly distinct. This is something new in American political history, and I'll talk about a little bit 
about that when I talk about how we got here. But th this, is a, this is actually the radical experiment that we've been running for the last decade or so. It's having two parties with no overlap and two parties that have very different cores. We have one party, Democratic Party, whose core is in cosmopolitan, urban America, multicultural, multiracial, uh, really, really uh, part of the global knowledge economy and has, has one vision of America. And we have another party, the Republican Party, that's based in rural, exurban America, traditionalist, older, white, uh, not as well integrated into the global knowledge economy, uh, and has a very different vision for America. And these two visions are in contrast, and we've created a party system that turbocharges that identity conflict, that, that, that battle, zero-sum battle over national identity. And in a moment in which we are going through demographic change, the worst possible political system we could have is one that, that makes that conflict seem zero-sum and has both sides fighting for these elusive but narrow majorities in Washington, uh, which creates a politics in which nobody wants to compromise with anybody because everybody wants to get back that narrow majority power that they think that they can just get and then they can impose their will on the other side. So uh, the escalating doom loop is what happens when we have this political situation. Two closely balanced parties competing for constant power and two very different parties competing for very different visions of America and everybody feeling like everything is incredibly high stakes uh, and it leads to gridlock, dysfunction, uh, leads to increasing demonization of the other party as not the other party, but as, as a threat to the country. Uh, no compromise leads to more gridlock, leads to more frustration with the system, leads to more anger, leads to more uh, zero-sum politics, leads to both sides increasingly cocooning themselves in their own information and social networks, different relationships with the truth, and that creates a fundamental threat. Democracy, self-governance, is a fragile thing. Uh, it, it depends on an agreement that we can disagree, but we have a process to resolve that disagreement. We have neutral arbiters. We have a way to, to have procedural fairness. We're losing that. Uh, I, I really worry what will happen in the 2020 election if it's close, whether we will accept a legitimate outcome. Uh, I, I worry about a lot of things. So I think the Fair Representation Act uh, breaks that zero-sum doom loop now, uh, which we'll talk about more later. Now, I want to just provide a, a, a little bit of historical context of, of how we got here. And I said that this is the first time that we have two genuine, distinct national parties in this country. It's the first time we have a genuine two-party system. Now, I know a lot of folks might say, well, haven't we always had a two-party system? And yeah, we, we have. But for a long time, those parties were really these broad overlapping coalitions. For a while, they were just national coalitions of state and local parties that were qu quite, a, quite a motley mix. Uh, and you know, if you went back to 1950, 1960, the critique of the American party system was not that the parties were too far apart. It was that they were too similar. They were indistinguishable, and it was hard for voters to tell the difference and make genuine choices. Uh, now, th that system had its problems uh, in, in another important respect. Uh, because it was largely premised on the continuation of the Jim Crow South and the uh, willingness of both parties not to deal with civil rights at the national level. Uh, but, you know, in retrospect, there, there was, you know, that, that, was, that was a party system that also kept democracy stable. Hell, hell of a trade-off. Uh, in, in the 1960s, we had the Civil Rights Revolution, uh, and that realigned p the parties, and it really nationalized politics uh, in a way that was new and different. Uh, it set in motion the, the, the transformation of American politics that gave us the, the, the fully sorted parties that we have now. But in an interregnum period from the mid-60s to the late 80s, I think we had something more like a functional government. Uh, and it was really a, a four-party system with liberal Republicans and liberal Democrats alongside conservative Republicans. And, conservative Democrats, and it was a system in which n n none of those factions, none of those parties had a clear majority. Everybody had a bargain with each other to get stuff done. And if you look at the Congress of that era, it was much stronger vis-a-vis -vis the executive branch. Also passed a lot of landmark legislation with large uh, bipartisan majorities. Uh, so I, 
it was a, a reasonably functional system. Not, not perfect, voters didn't always have clear choices for the parties, but at least it worked, worked with our governance. Now that began to collapse in the 1990s as the parties became uh, clearer on the broad culture war issues uh, as politics nationalized more and more, and as liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats started to go extinct. And we got the much clearer red and blue maps that, that we saw. And now we have a, a system in which there are very few parts of the country that are competitive between the two parties. Uh, so the Democratic Party has basically given up on half the country. Republican Party has basically given up, up on half the country. We have a handful of competitive elections in which a handful of people's votes matter. Is this this is, this is the democracy that we have, in which it's a democracy except only a handful of people get to decide everything for the country, and most people's votes don't matter. Uh, it's not, doesn't seem to meet the, the, the measure of democracy that I would hold up. Um, you know, uh, so this, is, this has been a long time coming, that this alignment of this, this genuine two-party system. And you know, again, I, I think it's a real disaster that we have a system that demands broad compromise in order to get stuff done. And a narrow majoritarian two-party system is completely at odds with that. And again, it is driving us all crazy because we've created this binary high stakes, zero sum politics in which nobody ever feels like they're winning and we're all losing. So that, that tees up the problem. I think Fair <laughs> Representation Act solves a bunch of these problems, uh, but now I'm going to turn it over to, to my esteemed colleague here, Neil Simon. Um, so first, thanks to NYU and thank you to Fair Vote, but there's somebody else we should all thank. We, we've got to thank the Democratic Party in Iowa for giving us the perfect advertisement for the Fair Representation Act. because. You guys get this, caucuses, the benefit of a caucus is supposed to be that at the end of it all, you have more people who are happy with the result in a situation where you have multiple candidates, right? If you start off with 10 candidates in a traditional primary, somebody could win with 20% of the vote, but with a caucus, you eliminate that. So ranked choice voting is basically a caucus system that is transparent, immediate, and private. People don't have to reveal who they're voting for. So it really is the perfect advertisement for what we're all doing here today. So thank you to the Democratic Party in, in Iowa. Um, so Lee's a political scientist and is a really accomplished fellow at New America and has written a, a, an incredible book. And it's very complimentary to, to my thinking. I, but I'm not a political scientist. I'm a guy who has spent his career running a few companies, and I happen to have spent the last few years trying to fix American politics, including as a candidate for the United States Senate in 2018. But when I was a student, I studied a little bit of political science, but what I really studied was <laughs> economics. And I'm telling you, the whole thing, I studied this as an undergrad at Brown, and when I got my MBA at the University of Chicago, it all comes down to two words, economics. Two words. I'm letting you all think about this for a second. It's incentives matter. Incentives matter. So when you think about your economics classes and those supply and demand classes and how price is set by, by the incentives, or you think about labor, you think about macroeconomics, a lot of it is just about incentives affecting behavior in the market. So that's the mind frame I bring to politics. I also saw this in my businesses. I had this one situation where at one of my companies, we, we managed a whole bunch of money and we had this group of analysts. We had this group of analysts and their job was to do two things, was to analyze investments to help us make investment decisions, but also to communicate with our investors. But one day we had this idea, hey, what if we gave them an incentive to also bring in new business? So we tried it. And so what do you think happened? They brought in a little bit of new business. They weren't very good at it. But what also happened is our investment performance actually got worse relative to peers. And the retention of our clients got a little worse relative to peers. Now, when I asked these analysts what they were doing differently, they, will all, they all said nothing. Our behavior has not changed. So human behavior changes sometimes when we don't even realize it's changing. We respond to incentives. 
So why am I telling you all this? So you gotta think about our political system, and I thought a lot about this as a candidate. If you are a rational person running for the House of Representatives or running for the United States Senate, and you look at what's out there, the first thing you, you start to understand is you look at the districts. So 70% of Senate seats are not competitive in the general election, and 90% of House seats are not competitive in the general election. So you realize that, so then you say, okay, so the only thing that matters here is the primary of one party or the other. Then you start to look at the primary. Well, who votes in the primaries? Well, in non-presidential years, congressional primaries attract about 20% of voters, and it tends to be 10% from each side. It's not exactly that way, but it lays out that way. So now all of a sudden you're thinking, okay, those are the voters who I really have to appeal to, the base of one party or the base of the other. And then you look at how money works. And I saw this. I would get PAC forms as a candidate. So I happen to be a pro-business guy. I come from the private sector. But I also think you know, climate change is real, and we've got to do something about this. And so I would get forms from conservation groups, but also from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and they'd ask me to check one set of boxes or another. But what if I'm someone who sees a little nuance in some of these things, and I can't check one set of boxes or the other? All that PAC money is out of reach. So your incentive, your financial incentive is also to appeal to one base or the other. And I saw this play out in so many <laughs> other aspects of our electoral system, whether it's the way ballot access works, debates work, and we, we can talk about some of that. But the whole system, in my view, incentivizes our politicians to be very divisive. So my experience on the campaign trail is that America is not as divided as we think. Your average Americans look at Washington as sadly broken. Your average Americans look at this red versus blue warfare with disgust. They don't feel part of it. They, they are against that and they want us to fix it. But if you're a politician and you're rational and you're running for office, or you're running for re-election, you have no reason to compromise, to collaborate, to work to across the aisle. There is really no reason. If almost everybody only cares about their base voters in their primary, there's no reason for this. So what my book's about, it tells stories from my campaign, from other campaigns around the country, but it's really about the incentive system. And then it's very much about 10 reforms to fix that. So the subtitle of the book is 10 Reforms to Reclaim Our Republic. And chapter eight is the fair vote chapter, is the fair representation chapter, the Rob Ritchie chapter. Um, and people have asked me, hey, Neil, of your 10 reforms, which would have the biggest impact on our country? And it is this one. There is no question. Unfortunately, this is the hardest one to explain. It's the wonkiest. It's the trickiest. But it would have the most profound impact on our political system because at the end of the day, it's what Lee talked about. At the end of the day, when you have single member legislative districts with first past the post voting, you naturally end up in this two party system and naturally over time we become more and more polarized. And the problem is not going to fix itself. And this act, the Fair Representation Act, does more to address that fundamental issue than anything else we can do. So I'm, I, I'm fully supportive of the act and so appreciative of what Fair Vote's done to fight for this for 25 plus years now. These guys are incredible and um, I'm, I'm, I'm an honored to be here with Lee and with Sangeeta. Well, thank you for the opening remarks. Um, this sets the stage for this conversation. Um, you come from uh, clearly very different narratives to very different stories. Lee, as a political scientist, having done the research, and w especially with the historical context that you m set, you mentioned how we got into the doom loop. Um, and Neil, with your own personal narrative about having run for the U.S. Senate in 2018, it seems that two very distinct perspectives and narratives have brought you to very similar conclusions, that it's about the system and we need to have a conversation about our electoral system and the incentives that are inherent in it. 
So Lee, my first question is to you. Um, why is the polarization of this moment both so unique and so urgent? And how do we break out of this doom loop to allow and enable big reforms like the Fair Representation Act to, to, to take place and to happen? Yeah, so, <coughs> so why now? Wh why does American politics feel uh, so existential? so polarized, so broken. And uh, I mean, the, the argument that I make in the book is, is that really there is something qualitatively new about this moment. It, it's a process of American political development that we've reached a stage in which we have truly nationalized parties uh, and they are divided by geography and uh, the, the country is basically split in half and there's no clear resolution it's not like you know Democrats might might win in 2020, uh, but <sighs> now th then there will be a backlash. Then Democrats won't have Trump to run against, and you know things will swing back and forth. We've had this basic pendulum politics for almost 30 years now, where it goes from unified government to divided government to unified government to divided government. But, uh, there's there's no clear resolution, and that's what's making things so bitter because both sides feel like you know if I lose. I'm gonna to be totally out of power and, and my humanity is gonna be challenged and if I win, I can cr use that power to crush the other side. That is a dangerous way to run a country. It's what the framers feared. They, they, they feared parties, but they, what they really feared was a majority party oppressing a mi mi minority party and for good reason. So then the question is, well, how on earth do we change this, right? I mean, we might, might recognize that, that there is a, a real problem here and the Fair Representation Act might seem like a like a very smart uh, reform but then well w like how do the parties themselves change the system how do the members of congress themselves change the system by which they got elected now i i, I see two complementary avenues here one is from the bottom up that folks in a, in this country are, are deeply frustrated with how the system is working we haven't seen this level of frustration probably since the time before the progressive era. And I think there are a lot of uh, a lot of parallels between our era and the progressive era. And in that era, social movements built up and demand for reform came up. And we made some pretty radical changes to how we do democracy in this country. Uh, and that was because people got organized and people got mobilized and people demanded change. And you know what? When people demand change and reform it becomes a political issue in itself, politicians respond to that incentive because politicians respond to what's popular. Now, uh, we'll hear the view from Washington when we get Congressman Beyer here, but having you know, been around this town uh, for a while, a lot of members of Congress and people who work on the Hill understand that the system doesn't work and they don't like the hyper-partisanship. They don't like being warriors in a, in a, in a, in what feels like trench warfare, but they haven't thought of a way out. I think one of the, the, the great advantages of the Fair Representation Act over other democracy reforms is that it doesn't benefit one party or the other. It's, it's, you know, it doesn't help Democrats, doesn't help Republicans, it helps the American people. And I think we, we've got to tell that story. There we go. Ah. You guys are so polite. You're supposed to, you know, raise your hands, scream when the mic's not working. Um, but 
So whether or not Trump's elected in November or it's Bernie or Elizabeth or whoever it is, we're not gonna wake up the next morning much more unified and much more functional. We're still gonna have all the problems that we're talking about today. I did an event like this the other day with somebody who, I'll leave nameless, but he said, hey, I'm maxing out to four Democratic candidates and because the number one thing we have to do is defeat Donald Trump. And I'm sitting there thinking, hey, why don't you max out to four reform organizations that are addressing the underlying illness in our political system? Right? I believe we have this underlying illness, which is a broken incentive structure that pushes all of our candidates and lawmakers to these two dogmatic, ideological, extreme sides. And that until we address that, we're just gonna keep cycling in the doom loop. Please doom loop. So that's that's how I think about the moment we're in. We, we gotta get the rest of the country to care about this and to stop being so focused on November. Uh, thanks for those comments. Um, it's halfway and what we have is, um, we'd like to hear some questions from the audience. There are folks uh, walking around with uh, note cards. Um, We'd love to take some questions from the audience. Um, uh, but Neil, in the meantime, while we collect the note cards, I have a question. So November 4th, I think November 3rd is the election. Next day we wake up, whoever wins. How do we change the incentive system? Let's say um, victory has been um, you know, decided, uh, the person conceding has conceded, uh, it's happy, it's peaceful. What can we do the next day to, um, to change this systemic doom loop that we're part of? Right. So, so I think there are a set of reforms that we should all be in favor of. This is what my book's about. The subtitle is 10 Reforms to Reclaim Our Republic. And we have some momentum behind some of these things. And they're happening at the state level. So 2018, there were 23 statewide ballot initiatives that passed several about redistricting commissions, a few about campaign finances. We got ranked choice voting in Maine, in um, some other municipalities. 2019, ranked choice voting expanded to New York, more than doubling the number of people who are using ranked choice voting. So there is momentum at the state and local levels and we need to keep building on that and all of you, wherever you live, gotta keep fighting for those different reforms. And then hopefully it eventually crescendos into a national movement and a national set of reforms. Kind of what happened at the turn of the last century during the progressive era where we got direct election of senators and women's suffrage. That was the result of people like you guys getting involved and affecting change, first at the local and state level and then at the national level. That's, that's what I'm hoping happens. And I'll tell you, there are thousands of people that think the way we do now. I've been to events with thousands of people, but it needs to be millions. It needs to be millions. We gotta get the word out. We gotta get other people energized. This is why I wrote the book, is to attract more people into this movement. Um, and that's, that's really what I think we need to do on November 4th. Thank you. And um, 5th and 6th. One more question, Lee, if you could take that. So we're clearly here to talk about the Fair Representation Act. There are also other promising reforms that would change some of these, in, uh, these incentives. Uh, would you comment on how some of those reforms might work in combination with the Fair Rep Act? W which reforms are you are uh, you thinking national of? National popular vote, um, other you know campaign finance reforms. Um. Yeah. So um, I mean, I, I'm certainly supportive of national popular vote, and if I could make an amendment to the Constitution, uh, th that's we can we can do that, right? Uh, would replace the Electoral College with a national popular vote with ranked choice voting. Um, but one of the nice things about the Fair Representation Act is it, 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 is it is something that is constitutional and we can do it now. Uh, we, we don't have to pass a constitutional amendment. Uh, you know, I'm also supportive of campaign finance reform, but you know, I, I think the, the highest leverage right now is the Fair Representation Act because it fundamentally changes the incentives of members of Congress and how they get elected. And you know, frankly, I, you know, I, I, I'm a supporter of, of more parties and I think it would create space for more parties. And I think having more parties would be a, a core thing that would break the zero sum uh, binary that is preventing anything from getting passed. Look, if you look at polling on money and politics reform, you will see 70, 80% think we ought to have some reform to the way we let private companies and wealthy people 
uh, basically run our countries, run our country. But that, that reform is stuck in Congress because we have a gridlocked Congress. Climate, immigration, guns, pick your issue. There are majorities that support change, but things get gridlocked in Congress because of the screwed up incentive structure and the binary hyperpartisanship. So whatever your issue is, and there are a lot of important issues out there, if you have a Congress and a government that doesn't work and all the incentives are just to blast the other side and then run to, run to your base, nothing is going to get solved. So here's a question from the audience. Um, one reaction to Iowa is keep it simple. Is it too risky to go for a, a national ambitious reform like the Fair Rep Act, better to let states and cities experiment? What is your view on that, Neil? Ultimately, I think we'd all like to see a number of these reforms happen at the federal level. So ultimately, that requires federal legislation like the Fair Representation Act. We're not close to getting that to happen yet, so I think you have to take steps to make it happen. So steps like ranked choice voting in New York and in municipalities in Utah, um, I think are steps in that direction. And the more places we can enact it on a local level, the better chance we'll have to ultimately being successful at, at the national level. Great, so mainstream it across the country so it becomes the norm yes. and you're ready for federal. And you gotta get people used to using it, right? It is slightly more complicated, you can't deny that, but you gotta get people to where the people of Australia and Ireland are, they're used to it. It feels normal to them, it's not a big deal. To Americans, we're not there yet, so little by little, we, we've got to get there. Okay. Lee, this one is for you, I think. Um, if Fair Representation Act creates a multi-party democracy, how will our current polarization be channeled? Will we still have polarized parties, intense partisanship? Uh, we, m I, we might have polarized parties, we might have partisanship, but when you have five or six parties, you can govern on you can build coalitions. I mean, look, if you look at multi-party democracies in Western Europe, there is a fair amount of polarization, but there is a spectrum. And so parties can build polarization and uh, or it's parties can build compromised coalitions despite that polarization because then you can have parties of the center represented. Uh, the problem is when you have two parties competing for narrow power, representing two very different visions, you can't have compromise, you can't have coalition building. And that is the danger. That, you know, the, the, the divisions, some of them are, are manufactured by, by the partisan conflict, some of them are real. But we need a system that allows us to work through those differences and doesn't create uh, th these, these weird binary incentives where everything has to be all or nothing, my side or nothing. If I can add one thing, I think you guys all get this, right? But imagine an election where the three of us are running against each other using ranked choice voting. Here's what I'm not gonna do. I'm not gonna sit here telling you that Sangeeta or Lee are stupid and evil. What I'm gonna do instead is say, you know, Lee and I agree on a lot of things. Here are one or two things where we don't agree, but he's a smart guy and we agree on a lot of things. Rank because him second. I, because I want his second place votes, Rank right? If you're a supporter of Lee's, Maybe. I want your second place votes. So there's this natural incentive to behave more civilly. There's a natural incentive to behave in a way that's very different than what we're all used to now. In, in the political system that we have today with all our incentive systems, my incentive is to say, he's evil, he's stupid, and I'm not gonna compromise one inch on anything. Yeah, because right? if you and disqualify me. That's, that, that's part of why we need this so badly. Uh, one more question. How much has Citizens United changed or warped the election process? Um, sure. it, it's been a big deal, right? And that's chapter five of my book is, there are two reforms in my book that require a constitutional amendment, and those are the hardest. This is one of them. And the two parts of the Citizens United issue are one is, are corporations people? And the second is, should the government, the federal and state level governments be allowed to set limits on campaign contributions? And 
I do not think that corporations should have the same rights as people. They never did. That's never the way our Constitution was interpreted. And I do think that it would be healthy for our democracy to set limits. So that has played a big role. But whoever asked that question, I'll tell you this. If we only did campaign finance reform, which is critically important, but if we only did that, all it would do is make the current system cheaper, but we would still have the same warped incentives. Right? You might get rid of some of the financial craziness that I described before, but you'd still have at, the, at, at our core the same broken incentives. I'll tell you. You're better at this. <laughs> if you need to come to one of us for technology advice, he's your guy. Um, so I came largely from the financial services industry. I started a company in 2002, and I remember when I first got into the industry, I looked at the whole landscape, and what I found was appalling. Hidden fees, people with crazy incentives to sell different products and make lots of money. It was broken. When I went into politics a few years ago, I found exactly the same thing. That's how our campaign finance system works. Hidden contributions. Right, you can give limitless amounts of money to dark money groups, super PACs, that, that give to super PACs and run negative ads in any campaigns. This happened in my campaign. And by the way, there's a super PAC forum to support me <laughs> in addition to the, the one fighting me. I had nothing to do with it. You can't coordinate directly with the campaigns, but people can essentially give a limitless amount of money anonymously to participate in our political process. That's not right. So we, we definitely need to do something about it. But it won't solve everything. None of these things are silver bullets, right? Gerryman fixing gerrymandering is not a silver bullet. Opening primary is not a silver bullet. Campaign finance reform is not a silver bullet. As close as we get is the Fair Representation Act, but even that, we need to do other things as well. It will take a set of reforms to fundamentally change the incentives in our system. We, we need to do these things together. Uh, that's right. The silver bullet for ending gerrymandering might be the Fair Rep Act. Yeah, well, it helps a lot. You guys get this one also. The, the Fair Representation Act, one of the elements of it is multi-member districts. So you combine congressional districts into up to five members. So in my state, in Maryland, we have eight representatives. We would have two districts of four members each. So once you only have two districts instead of eight, so my, my state's one of the worst gerrymandered states in the country. Right, what the Democrats have done in my state. But if we only have two districts of four members each, it's hard to gerrymander that much. I mean, you're just drawing one line across the state. You, you can still play games a little bit, but the, the impact of gerrymandering is much, much less. And then if you still have independent commissions, you could really mitigate the impact of it. So it does, so this act addresses that a lot as well. Thank you. So that was actually what you already answered one of the questions here. How do multi-member multi districts work? Um, you mentioned that a little bit, Lee. Could you expand on that a bit more? And then you mentioned, Niels, um, there might be some games being played. What might those reduced level of uh, games you know, that are being played might be? Yeah, so you can multi member districts, you, com you, you combine one district, you combine four districts into one, and then you have proportional voting, as, as George described. I mean, uh, gerrymandering is a uniquely American problem. Uh, and gerrymandering is really only possible when you have single member districts uh, and two highly polarized parties. It just it just doesn't make any sense with multi member districts and proportional voting because you can't. There's there's not much profit in gerrymandering. So we're spending all this money. I mean, redistricting is important, but you know all this all these resources on on trying to trying to to fix. Uh, uh, districting. And, th and the real problem is not gerrymandering, it's geography. It's the fact that we have a party system in which there's one party uh, of urban America, so Democrats get all these uh, disproportionate seats in urban America, and then Republicans have all these safe seats in rural and exurban America. And that's the problem. And the way you fix that is not through independent redistricting commissions, it's through the Fair Representation Act. Thank you um, th for this great discussion. We have three more panels um, that will cover various aspects of the Fair Rep Act. So please stay tight and it'll be interesting. Um, thank you very much to the panelists. And please check out the books as well.